Don't ask people to be at the same time data scientist and demand planner. The accuracy KPI is not the one that you should be interested or worried about. You should old school mindset where human are piloting the models and you manually select the model and you're gonna push the parameter until the model gives you the forecast you want to see. Um, I'm someone who's genuinely uh, passionate about inventory planning and demand planning, and I've only been doing that for now eight to 10 years. And I'm only working on trying to deliver inventory planning model and demand planning model for, for companies. Um, so I have these two subjects, but I'm trying to attack them from different point of view. At times I'm writing books, at times I'm teaching at university, or I'm training professional, or I'm creating a model for, for a big company. So each time I'm trying to attack this one subject, but from a different point of view, with a different objective to a different audience. And I think this helps me to get like a better understanding of it. But personally, I always like to say that I'm still on a learning journey. I'm, I'm changing my mind on some things. I'm discovering new ideas and trying out new things. So I also change the way I work and the way I do that all the time. And it's kind of for sure that in two years, the way I, I'm doing what I do today will be different. That's for sure. Right, right, right. No, no, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, the two keywords, forecast error and uh, inventory, which is there in your uh, LinkedIn banner as well, 30% and 20%. I remember that. <laughs> and in most of the videos, you try to cover that part as well. So, so if we start from the basics, so what is demand planning and uh, what are the key components in that area? If you can help us understand from your perspective. So for me, I really see demand planning in general as, let's say, a process. And the objective of this process is to create accurate information and to give this information to other processes. So these other processes can make decisions. So um, let's take a concrete example. You said ice cream, demand planning. It's really trying to say, well, in the future, people will want to buy so much ice cream and this type of ice cream. Okay? So it's really information. Right. You you collect this information, you try to predict what's going to happen, and then you give this to other people, for example, uh, purchasing people, supplier, um, so they can buy the right amount of ice cream, and then they can bring that to the client. But for me, demand planners, it's really, there is no decision. You're going to leave decision to other people who might take some aggressive decisions or defensive decision. that's totally fine. But you, your role is really just to collect information and to make accurate prediction of what's going to happen uh, based on the current course of action. Right, right. And I, I, I know that you emphasize a lot on the uh, role of demand planners to be on the more on the gathering information side and then using it appropriately rather than focusing on optimizing the models, which is a different aspect altogether. So, so, yeah. so the cycle you just explained, so I'm sure that there, there, there is one data point the data side of it, which relates to the gather information side, and then using it uh, again in the data form or maybe in the modeling form. So um, as you cover in most of your posts uh, regularly that there are so many challenges, but sometimes things can be managed in an easy manner and a simplified manner, like moving average post you recently posted. So which is very simple, but still lots of organization are not doing it. So if you can briefly cover about the key challenges which industries are facing currently, you are helping them and how how the data is very critical on in that channel altogether end to end. Yeah, I, I think that, so let's imagine today you are a supply chain leader and you have a demand planning process. I think your main objective out of this demand planning process is that you get the most accurate and the most useful for the customer. And at the same time, you want the process to scale in the sense that you don't want to hire 100 people to do that. So you want to reduce resources or keep resources to a minimum and at the same time achieve the highest possible accuracy. So how do you get there? And, and this relates to the question of moving average. What I realized with my clients is that most of the time, supply chain will only measure accuracy. And they will say something like, well, it's a success if we achieve a better accuracy than last year or then if we achieve better accuracy than last month. And what they don't realize is that the market is changing. So 
It could just be that you achieve a better accuracy this month simply because the market was more stable this month or because you have fewer product than last year, things like that. Let's just imagine COVID, it's an extreme example, but in 2020, demand was totally chaotic. So if you just compare your accuracy this year to last year, if we are in 2021, you're going to say to your demand planning team, you are absolutely the best because you crushed the number compared to last year. But in practice, it doesn't mean anything because maybe your team is just doing a poor job. So what I propose instead is to say, well, let's compare ourselves to a very simple benchmark, which is just a moving average. So when you do a forecast and when you measure the accuracy of your forecast, instead of just saying, well, I was better than last month or better than my colleague or better than this other market, I want to be compared to just a moving average. So I'm making a forecast for next month and I'm doing a competitive uh, forecast, a benchmark forecast. It's just the average of the last 12 months. And I need to be more accurate than that. Now, for a lot of people, when I explain that, they think, okay, but that's too easy. Um, like we can beat that for sure. There is like no reason we would even be interested in this. But what I see over and over and over with my client is that if you have a company that never did that before, as they start to compare themselves to this moving average, they will realize most of them as they don't beat it. So the whole process, the whole team, the whole software, the, the, the package, everything cannot beat just averaging the sales of the last 12 months. And when they do, usually it's just like one or two or three percent. So then my work, once we establish that and we understand the baseline, is to help people in the process to go beyond and to add value beyond what a moving average can do. Okay. Okay. So generally, uh, what, which type of major challenges the bigger organizations are facing? You know, I, I, I think the main issue, and it's not a 61, is that people have difficulties to gather the right data. Um, and it's not a sexy problem, so people don't put attention to that. They're not excited about collecting data or cleaning data or anything like this. And they would like to put their attention on things that are kind of more sexy, more interesting, more appealing. But what I realized is that on my own project, I spend most of my time discussing, collecting, and cleaning data. And when I start to work for a client who told me, okay, we just implemented this big software, uh, the implementation took a year, and then I review with them, okay, what's the underlying data and what kind of data do we have there? After just an hour, we realized that we missed some data and the data that's there is not exactly what we need to have there. So there is a big mismatch on what's in the tool and what we really need in the tool. And on top of that, we are still missing some pieces of data. And, and despite the fact that the software might be brand new and it's a big software company with an implementation team and so on. So I think the, the interest and the, the know-how in what kind of data do we need and how to clean it is too low. And you know, I said, I'm, I'm also teaching at university. And when you think about teaching um, students at university, you might get classes on purchasing, on uh, you know forecasting, on data science, on anything you want. But there is one subject that we never teach is data cleaning. There is not a class called data cleaning 101, how to collect and clean data. So we don't train students. Professionals are not excited or interested and they don't want to invest. But then I see that actually that's, that's the main uh, weakness. Uh, coming from a sourcing background, um, especially in the indirect part of the sourcing data, Cleansing is a very critical component to, in fact, uh, handle a complex uh, database. So, so I, I'm able to relate to what you are saying because if the data is not cleansed and if people don't learn it properly or they are not uh, upskilled, so in the future they will become part of the organization. Then they will start. They will not be able to add value as well, right? Okay, okay. And and on the machine learning part, you have been suggesting a lot that. Uh, let the ML do the thing and your team focus on uh, information gathering and then using it properly. So if you can cover on that part as well, what is happening across the globe? Yeah, sure. So again, if you put yourself in the shoe of a supply chain leader, you have this demand planning process and the, the, the objective of that is to generate good forecast. And as shared, you want the forecast to be as accurate as possible, but you don't want to hire 100 people to do it. So you want to basically scale the process. How do you do that? You, you, you have two main building blocks. One is you want to rely on machine learning. And the other one is you need to have a few humans to enrich that. So let's try to explain this in a few minutes. So when I say that you need machine learning to do demand uh, planning, it's because machine learning will allow you to 
automatically generate good forecasts for all your products. So for a supply chain, you have thousands of products, you have maybe different regions, different market, different seasonal. I mean, it's a lot of combination. So you need to have a forecasting model that can cope with everything. Like new product, old product, promotion product, uh, product with shortages, you name it. You need to have a forecast engine that can cope with it because in your supply chain, it's going to happen. You're going to have new product, you're going to have uh, you're going to lose clients, get new clients, and so on. Machine learning, if done properly, because by default, it will not do anything. So if done properly, has the abilities to cope with all of that. So you get a model that can cope with everything and that can cope with, let's say, promotion, shortages, price changes, and so on. So you get a very, very good baseline and a baseline that works for everything. Now, statistical tool in, in the, uh, let's say, old school statistics, um, cannot cope with all these kind of inputs and all these things. So you could say, well, we don't have the resources to invest in machine learning. We don't have the knowledge. That's fine. You're going to stay to statistics. But then the issue you face is that you're going to get this amount of automation and scaling because, for example, each time you do a promotion, you need to manually review it, which might mean a lot of points that needs to be reviewed. Now, let's stick to machine learning. Let's imagine we have implemented that and this machine learning tool can cope with most of the business driver. There will, there will always be some sort of reminding finds that the tool cannot cope with. For example, it's a bit extreme, but it's just an example. The tool cannot call your client to ask how they're doing. But the demand planner can. So if you're a demand planner, you know that the tool is aware of promotion, price changes, recent shortages, uh, product life cycle, all of that. But the tool cannot call your client. So you can call your client to ask, how are you doing? How is the business going on your side? Are you about to do a big order? Or I see last month you did a big order. So how is it going now? And by doing that, you're a bit like a journalist, a, a reporter. So you're asking questions, you're getting information, and then maybe your client gives you like something interesting, maybe not. And then based on that, you can go and enrich the forecast. Now, what I'm advising for, so this combination of this automated and, and scaled machine learning and the human focusing on like the cherry on top of the cake, basically, like what kind of extra, extra piece of information I can bring. It's kind of very different from what supply chains tends to do today. In, a, in most of supply chains, not all, but most supply chains, what we at the core of this, we have human and they do and manually select forecasting models. But this cannot possibly scale because you need more and more and more human as you grow a supply chain. But on top of that, human are not computation machine. I wouldn't be able to look at the graph. You know, I've been working for this for nearly 10 years now. I cannot look at the graph and tell you this is the model and the parameter you need for this one. I have no idea. What I can do is an algorithm that does it for me. It's a computation machine. But human cannot, I'm not good at this. So right. we see it on a personal experience that human are not good at this. Academic also studied that and human are not good at that. And still supply chain rely on the idea that we're going to hire human and ask human to, based on the intuition, select model and fine tune them. And for me, this is a loss of time, but also it doesn't result in any good results. Yes, yes, right, right, right. So I think if the if you talk about the future, I think the future will always hold a combination of both the sides, but in the best optimized manner from the human side as well and from the... Uh, computational or the automation side as well. I I was because I keep talking to lots of people in the Asia Pacific side uh, of business uh, due to the nature of my work and uh, because of the industry people I know. Uh, what I have learned from them is that still there are so many organizations, uh, medium and large where this combination of both what you have explained rightly or it should be like that is still heavier on the human side like a lot of manual work is keep is still happening um companies are trying to figure out how they should focus on the computational side as well making good models and all but still they are struggling a lot and then over and above these uh, supply chain disruptions are not letting them you know work on the data properly even though ambiguity has become a uh, inherent part of the supply chain discussion now so um considering all these parameters um i know that in asia basic this is happening but is the trend same in the western part as well or the other part of the world where the comp the mix of human part and uh, the modeling part is balanced or it's still heavier on the 
human side or is it is it's just a trend which i am seeing in asia pacific side currently i, I think it, it really depends on the company the industry um you, you i've seen examples for companies that go for extremely high level of automation and i've seen companies that are really this um old school mindset where human are piloting the models and you manually select the model and you're gonna push the parameter until the model gives you the forecast you want to see okay and i've seen everything on the spectrum now i also have kind of a bias is that people contacting me need help and it means that the process is not working great so i tend to receive messages from people who find that the process is not doing great and i guess that if you're doing great if you reach this level of automation and so on you will not contact me and i will not get in a discussion with you because you're just thinking hey he's advising for this i'm already doing it it's going great i will not contact him for further services for sure um so unfortunately i cannot really provide this kind of global answer sign this is the okay. state I'm, I'm i'm doing my best personally to kind of convey some of these messages and i know that some of my message are really against common knowledge and common practice, but it's also very interesting on LinkedIn to get all these exchange with people when I propose an idea. At times I have people saying, oh, that sounds great, I should do it. At times I have people saying, yeah, I did that and it works. But I also get people saying, no, it's just a really, really bad idea and I'm totally against that, which is totally fine. I think we, we then have an exchange and I learn as well. As said, I am myself on a learning journey. And when I reflect on the last years, I changed my mind on, on various subjects. And I know I will still change my mind on other things in the future. I, I don't know which ones, but for sure in a few years, I might change my mind on some other uh, aspects. The last part of our discussion today, uh, which I generally ask every guest uh, uh, in my videos is basically, um, if you have to sum up the key skill sets or uh, even KPIs also to measure the success of um, any role or any profile or any area within the supply chain. So considering we are talking about demand planning, so what would that be? Maybe top three, four uh, skills or KPIs uh, to track? So for the skills point of view, I find it's one of the, my current messages for supply chain earlier is don't ask people to be at the same time data scientists and demand planners. So for me, you have some people who are really good at um, getting information, communicating with your clients and so on, demand planners. And you have some people who are really good at making models, reviewing models, creating a model as data scientist. And for me, these two roles should be separate. That's okay. one point. In terms of success criteria, it goes back to the previous subject we talked about. For me, the accuracy KPI is not the one that you should be interested or worried about. You should be interested in Am I beating this moving average? Okay. Again, as shared, you're going to have good month, bad month, good market, bad market. That's totally normal. But if you compare yourself to the moving average, the moving average is also moving and impacted by the markets as your team. So I'm mostly interested in by how much we can beat this uh, benchmark. And nowadays, when I do a project, the first thing I do is to implement this comparison to a moving average. And as long as we don't have this, I cannot make any improvement or, or, or any project, because if we do something, we don't, we are not able to compare it to like kind of a fixed benchmark. So that's really my first step for any project. Implement this moving average, compare yourself to it. Okay. So basically, if I see that uh, you explain about the roles, uh, which roles to be considered, and then the second part, the KPIs and the uh, how to tackle that when you handle the projects. Great, perfect. Um, I, I think these are the questions which I wanted to cover and, and thanks a lot, uh, Nicholas. Uh, the topic is very big. We both know that <laughs> one call will not justify it, but I think it's a good start. I wanted to um, help my audience with basic questions coming from someone who has a good following on LinkedIn, who regularly talks about it like you. And you have been so helpful in explaining all the concepts. So thank, thanks a lot for that. You're welcome. Thank you.